Uh, so, it's a big week for us. It's a big week. One, today is my son's birthday. He turns three. So happy birthday, Malachi. Uh, two, it's a significant week because uh, we are in the Living Story series, uh, which we've done since the beginning of 2021, uh, our journey through God's Word. Uh, we're committed to reading through the entirety of Scripture, and we've been committed to preaching in tandem with that Scripture. So we started in Genesis, we made our way all the way to the book of Psalms. Now today, or what we covered this week, was Psalm 107 through Psalm 139. And let me encourage you, if you're like, Mike, what are you talking about? I'd love to start reading the Bible. I really don't know where to start. We have all the resources for you. We have a Bible for you. We can send it your way. Uh, we have uh, Bible reading plans where a lot of us are reading through the Daily Walk Bible here. And uh, we'd love for you to join us on the journey. So check out the website. It's all on there for you. I entitled the message today, Living in Praise. Living in Praise. A reason why uh, today's significant is because we're going to be landing in Psalm 117. Uh, psalm 117 is an interesting psalm for a couple different reasons. One is that it's the shortest psalm out of all the 150 psalms. It's only two verses. But I think what's unique about Psalm 117, and I didn't realize this until this week, is that it's actually uh, the marker of the middle of the Bible. So if you've been reading uh, since January 1, we have made it. You have made it to the middle of the of scripture. It's a huge accomplishment. We love Psalm 117 for that. Uh, though it's brief, I would say that Psalm 117 is also significant because it, uh, it, it's, it's a proclamation of the supremacy, of the love, of the mercy, of the grace, of the faithfulness of God. And I think ultimately, not only is it a proclamation, but within two verses, it is a grand exhortation of praise. The psalmist is calling us to a place and to a uh, to posture our heart to praise God. It's a calling that I really want to land on and expound upon today and ask ourselves the question of praise, like why praise? When praise? Like how should we praise? Who should be praising God? Where should we praise God? I want to answer all those questions. Why do we praise God? So what we're going to learn today and this is the bottom line truth, is that praise is a direct reflection of His glory. Praise is a direct reflection of His glory. Okay, so you ready to dive in? Let's do it. Uh, verse 1 of chapter 117 of the book of Psalms says this, Praise the Lord, all you nations. Praise Him, all you people. Of the earth. So right off the bat, you see this call to praise. But what I want you to notice is the audience here, that the psalmist is not only speaking to a Jewish audience, of course, those who are uh, in Israel, those who are connected to the covenant of God, but what he's saying is, praise the Lord, all you nations, all you people of the earth. He's, he's talking about every territory, every people group, every ethnic group, every tribe, every person. This, this was a call for everyone, not only a Jew, but for the Gentiles, for the foreigners, not only a man, but for women and children, of course, not only for those who were free, but those who were slaves, those who were servants, everyone in between. The psalmist here, right off the bat, he's recognizing uh, just like the, the reach of God, uh, the supremacy and the reach of God and the diversity of God's people, that no one, no one, no one is excluded from God, that true Jerusalem, that the true kingdom of God is all-encompassing, that it didn't, it wasn't limited in any way to just Israel alone. I, I, I think this is something that is critical for us to just kind of land on to marinate in because it's easy to skip over this. It's easy to read over it and not think twice about it. But I'll tell you, in our fallen world, 
in our broken state as sinners, you know, we have this tendency, whether we know it or not, whether we like it or not, we, we have a tendency uh, to overlook or to exclude or to devalue people based on our own ignorance, based on our misconceptions, based on stereotypes, based on, uh, you know, social, political, religious differences, based on how people think or how they act or what they believe. But the reminder here, if we just you know, pause, a good reminder here is that God is supreme overall, that no one is overlooked by God, that no one is devalued by God, that all fall under the glory, the majesty, the authority of God, that all have been created uh, to bear the very image of God, that all are within the reach of Yahweh. Uh, you actually, if you go to Revelation chapter 7, you see just a picture of what the future of the throne room of God will look like. This is a, a prophecy from John. It says in Revelation 7 verse 9, After this, I saw a vast crowd, all peoples on earth, all, you know, all nations, all peoples on earth. I saw a vast crowd, too great to count, from every nation and tribe, and people, and language, standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb, who is Jesus. This is the, uh, this is basically the theology behind that song that, you know, you learn as a kid that Jesus loves me, um, or Jesus loves the little children, right? All the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white, uh, they are precious in His sight. Jesus, He loves the little children of the world. There is no one that is devalued by God, that all are within reach of God. And then the psalmist, he concludes in uh, verse 2. He gives the reason for that call to praise. He says, for His unfailing love for us. Is powerful. In other words, God, God's love, His deepest expression of His character, it's strong, it's mighty, it's powerful. It prevails over everything, prevails over all. It is holy. It is just. It is merciful. It's full of grace. It never fails, and it always draws all creation to himself. This is the unfailing love of God. The second half says the Lord's faithfulness endures forever. And so his love is not only unfailing and powerful, but his faithfulness is eternal, that it is forever, that God is perfectly loyal and consistent to his own name and to his own word and to his own character. That, that his word is infallible, that his word is objective truth forever, uh, that there's no such thing as a broken promise or an empty promise from God, that all of his promises, they'll, they'll never return void, uh, that, that his plans and that his purposes and that his ways, they're faithful, that, that he, you know, he's, it's always fresh, it's always real, it's always intact, it's always eternal. And so for his unfailing love for us is powerful. The Lord's faithfulness over his creation, it endures forever. And then he concludes in the, you know, one final call and he says, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And so we see, we can see how this psalm was powerful for people to hear, to repeat, to sing uh, for this original audience. But, but I would say, for you and for me, on this side of the cross, this is a psalm that is twice as potent. I mean, it's powerful for us. This is real and raw for us because for you and for me, we've seen the ultimate evidence of God's unfailing love, of His powerful love, and of His eternal faithfulness in His one and only Son, Jesus, right? May I remind you, John 3.16, the most you know, familiar passage in all of Scripture, that God so loved the world. That's, you know, that's all encompassing, right? That He loved the world, 
that he gave his one and only son, Jesus, that whosoever, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, no matter how far you, you know, may be from God, no matter what mistakes you've made in the past, in the present, or in the future, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. The book of Romans chapter 15, verse 8, the Apostle Paul puts it this way. Remember that Christ Jesus came as a servant to the Jews to show that God is true to the promises he made to their ancestors. He also came so that the Gentiles, the foreigners, those were, who were outside that original covenant with God, might give glory to God for his mercies to them. We see his unfailing love. We see his mercy and his power, knowing that the wages of our sin was death, was this, you know, our souls separated from life, separated from heaven, separated from our purposes that we were originally created for, separated from uh, satisfaction and fulfillment, a destiny of destruction for us because of our sin. Yet the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, that he sent his one and only son, Jesus, the perfect son of man and the perfect son of God, born unto the Virgin Mary. His father was God. He knew no sin. Uh, he became sin so that you and I might become right with God again. He lived the perfect, sinless, holy life, died the perfect death on the cross, rose to new life three days later, uh, ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, and is coming again. It's, it's through Jesus and Jesus alone that every person on earth, that every sinner has been given this opportunity to be saved from their sin, to be set free, to be made whole again, to, to find deep soul satisfaction, to be reconciled back to the Father. It's every sinner's opportunity to encounter the power of God's love and to encounter the power and, uh, and uh, his faithfulness forever. And so listen, this was two verses. Th this is a lot to unpack here, right? This is the psalmist revealing the very essence and the very nature of God's uh, prevailing love and his enduring faithfulness. And it's this, this uh, supernatural and divine covering that is a gift for everyone to take hold of. And the, you know, the theme of this psalm is that for all of us who encounter the love of God, who encounter the faithfulness of God, what's our response? Well, it's praise. Our response is, is, is just praise. It's praise. Praise the Lord. Praise Him. Praise the Lord, the psalmist concludes. And so for the next just couple minutes, uh, what I'd like to do is to just study the significance and uh, application of our praise. Now, what I think is interesting is that this psalm, Psalm 117, it, it kind of is, is a culmination of the entirety of the psalms in that this call to praise God, it happens through the psalms 93 different times. In fact, if you remember a couple weeks ago, we talked about uh, the origin of the word psalms, the title of this book. It actually means uh, songs of praise. And so this is all about praise. A at its core, that word praise, as the psalmist used, what we see in the Hebrew, is that it's a, it's a word that means to admire. It's a word that means to glorify, to exclaim hallelujah to uh, extol the greatness of a divinity, or in this case, to extol the greatness of God, of course. And so in other words, what the psalmist is saying here is that praise is a direct reflection of his glory. Our praise, my praise, whatever that may look like, it is an expression of worship. It's an expression that recognizes that unfailing love of God. It's an expression that recognizes the eternal faithfulness of God. 
It's an expression that you actually see that goes beyond humanity and is for all of creation to do that. All of creation, it participates in the praise and in the reflection of the glory of God. If you read through scripture, what you see is that the angels, they praise God. They sing of his glory in heaven and on earth in different situations. Uh, you actually see in if you read the book, uh, if you read Psalms 146 through 150, it's all about praising God, the nature, uh, or it's all about nature and creation praising God, the sun and the moon and the stars and fire and hail and snow and rain and the mountains and the hills, the valleys, the trees, the animals, every created thing praising God, revealing the vastness of just his greatness, of his majesty. You think about like, I, I've been to the Grand Canyon before. You stand on the edge of the Grand Canyon and it's as if this beauty is just saying something about the greatness of our God. It, it, uh, the book of uh, Luke chapter 19, Jesus actually says, he's like, you know, even... Even the rocks, even these rocks, they're going to praise God. Even these rocks will burst into cheers for me. Essentially, what we read throughout Scripture is that all of heaven and all of earth is just involved in this praise, a praise that reflects the glory of God and a praise that has a testimony that reveals His worth uh, to all who see. And so when it comes to our praise, like when it comes to this call over our life, I don't know, like I, maybe you're in my boat and I'm a pastor and I feel this way. Sometimes it can feel like overwhelming or like maybe confusing, like, and it brings up some questions like, okay, so what does it mean to even praise God? Like, when am I supposed to praise, praise him? How, how, how do I praise him? Um, what does it even look like? Well, I want to search scripture and just answer a couple of those questions. And let me qualify it for you uh, by saying this, that, that it's impossible to praise God without the Spirit of God. It's impossible to praise Him without His Spirit leading us. Um, John 4 verse 23 puts it this way. This is Jesus speaking to His people. He says, look, but the time is coming. Indeed, it's here now. When true worshipers, those who will praise God, true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. In spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship Him that way. The book of Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul says, Those who don't have the Holy Spirit in them don't belong to Him at all. We, we need God's Spirit dwelling in and among us. We need His Spirit because His Spirit is uh, the primary purpose of the Spirit of God is to glorify the Father and to glorify the Son. It's the Holy Spirit who teaches us, who counsels us, who advocates for us, Jesus says. It's He who you know, is the giver of these gifts of joy and of peace and of patience, of kindness, of life, of strength of wisdom, of insight. It's the Holy Spirit who, who leads us uh, towards the truth. It's the Holy Spirit who testifies about our Savior Jesus. It's the Holy Spirit who inspires all of our praise. And so to praise God, to, to, to truly and authentically reflect the glory of God, we've got to be baptized. We've got to be filled with His Spirit. Now, how are we filled with the Spirit of God? Well, we're, we're filled when we surrender to the Son of God, to Jesus. We, we repent of our sin. We turn from our ways. Uh, we, we, we surrender and say, Lord, my life is yours. We give it all up for him. We believe that Jesus died, that he rose again, that he ascended into heaven, that he's the Lord and Savior of our life, that he's coming again. We, we surrender to his direction. We surrender to uh, just being obedient to him. Uh, and we receive all that he has for us. We receive forgiveness and mercy and grace, and we receive his spirit. 
that he sends to us, that he gives to us. The Bible says that when we come to Jesus, when we surrender our life to Jesus, that we're saved and that we're sealed with the Spirit of God. And from now until eternity, we are filled with God's Spirit living and breathing and active in our life. And so that's, that's a qualification for us to praise God, is to be led by the Spirit of God. But I also want to qualify our praise by saying, look, pray, praise isn't a Sunday thing. Praise is a life thing, okay? It's not all about what we do or what you're doing right now sitting in front of the TV. It's not about what we do uh, you know, at church on a Sunday morning. It's so much more. Praise can happen whenever, wherever, however. It, it, it's in all times, in every season, in every place. And I think it can happen in so many different ways. But I want to offer you three. So let's talk about three ways that we can really live out or live in praise to God. Now, I think the most familiar way that we praise God is we do so out loud. Um, you know, you read through scripture and you just see this calling over our life to praise him, to sing psalms, to sing hymns, to sing songs, spiritual songs, to make music. David says, go grab your tambourine, grab your harp. Let's praise God together. We read uh, through the book of Psalms to dance and to lift up our hands and to shout and to make a joyful noise to the Lord. This, this is the type of uh, praise that I think, at least for me, I assume it's most of us, is just like kind of wired in us. It, it comes naturally. Like this is the type of praise that comes when, you know, the Niners score a touchdown or when the Giants hit the, uh, the walk-off home run. I mean, we cheer, we stand, we clap, we get loud, right? This is the type of praise that happens as a parent. Uh, you know, I told you my son is three years old today. We're potty training him. He's like 95% potty trained, but we still, you know, we celebrate. Every time he goes pee in his little penguin potty, we are just dancing, we're clapping, we're high-fiving, we're cheering. We want to give praise. Like, we want to give praise where praise is due, right? And one natural way for do that to do that is just celebrating outwardly. We want to let him know how much we just love him. And this is a way to do it. We want to let him know that we love what he's doing, right? In the same way, this is why we make music. This is why we, you know, have worship on the front and in the back end of our gatherings. This is, this is why we, uh, or worship in the form of music. This is, this is why we sing together. This is why, uh, you know, we, we lift our hands to Jesus. It's, it's a natural way to cheer him on. It's a natural way to praise him, to connect with him, to let him know how much we love him to let him know how much we just love his love over us and his faithfulness in our life, to let him know how much we just love what he's doing. And so we praise God out loud. We fill our, we fill our lives with just music and song and dance and just joy for him. I think praise goes beyond that. Uh, another way that we can praise God and really live in our praise is praise him with an active faith. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it says, And it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. You see, faith is an expression of praise because it shows God that we trust him. It reveals the reality of our, like, authentic and our real hope in him and in him alone. Faith is a means of saying, look, God, I know, like I know about you. I know all the information or, you know, I'm learning all the information. I, I, I know, I, I believe that you died and that you rose for my sins. I believe that you are the savior of the world. But faith takes it one step further and says, not only do I believe, not only do I receive it, but I walk with it. Like, this is, this is something that I really trust you in. This is an action step that I'm taking to trust you. See, it's our faith that takes all the glory off of ourselves and puts it just back on God. And so for us, you know, we, we can praise God by just trusting Him in and through life, trusting Him 
with our family, trusting him with our marriage, trusting him with our hopes and our dreams and our desires, that he would fill those, trusting him in the workplace, in the classroom, when, uh, you know, it, in the midst of our busyness, but also trusting him in rest, like trusting him with the Sabbath. I think we, you know, we, we can praise God as we trust Him in our relationships, praise Him as we trust Him in our finances, praise Him as we trust Him in our pain and in our grief and in our ups and in our downs and in our you know, doubts and in our fear. We, we live out this praise of God as we actively walk in our faith and as we trust in Him. Finally, you know, we can praise God not only out loud, not only with this active faith, but also with our attitude. We praise God with our attitude. Listen to what uh, the Apostle Paul uh, exhorts to the church or encourages the church in Philippians 4 verse 8. He says, And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true, and honorable, and right, and pure, and lovely, and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. See, what Paul reminds us here is that in the middle of every situation and circumstance, even our thoughts, our deepest thoughts, even our attitude, it's all capable of praising God, of reflecting His glory. And I got to tell you, man, this is what gets me because it's, this is challenging for me because I would say that sometimes my attitude is more prideful than it is praiseful. Does that make sense? That I, you know, instead of reflecting God and His love and His faithfulness and His glory, I'm reflecting, my attitude reflects my own impatience and my own desires and my own will and, event, you know, my own some sort of glory. And so how do we like reorient ourselves? How do we reorient our attitude to praise Him and not ourselves? How do we move from a posture of pride to a posture of praise? Well, um, I think one way that I'm really challenging myself is to just practice gratitude, to, to just be constantly thanking Him in the good times and in the bad. Thank Him for His love and for His faithfulness. Uh, you know, thank Him for His presence for His grace, for His promises, for His mercy, for His provision. I think if we, if we practice this gratitude uh, and as we have this attitude of thanksgiving, you know, this is a sign of appreciation to God. And what we see in Scripture, that thanksgiving, it's a posture of praise that truly, truly honors God. And so we practice gratitude. I think we can also practice reverence. We can, you know, instead of uh, instead of flippancy, we can enter into his presence with humility, with our hands open, with this like childlike wonder and awe. As we enter into, you know, his word daily, you know, we, we come with an open heart and an open mind for him to speak, for him to reveal himself. When we enter into prayer, uh, we don't do so to just check it off the box. We don't do it as a last resort, but we pray, uh, you know, with great expectancy that God would hear and answer. We, we pray with gratitude. At the same time, when we enter into His church, now I know that that traditionally looks different right now, but as we enter into His church as a community of followers, that we do so with joy and we do so with, you know, uh, reverence and engagement knowing that he's brought us together, not for us to just, uh, you know, find some sort of entertainment on a Sunday morning, not for us to just attend uh, by ourselves, not for us to just go to church and just say we went to church, but to be the church, to engage, to be reverent, to, to, to be reverent towards his calling for you and for me to serve one another, to love one another, to engage with one another, to be the bride, to be the light of the world. 
And so, you know, we, we practice this reverence. And I think another way we can reorient our attitude is just practice contentment. I, I heard this pastor say once that he is most glorified, God is most glorified when we are most satisfied in him. And so for me, it's like I'm, I'm seeking God. I'm learning to seek God, not because of what he offers us, but simply because of who he is. Like to take pleasure in just him alone, his nature and his character and his goodness. To, to be satisfied, to be wholly and completely satisfied in his work. Uh, in, in, in his word, in, in his promises, in his direction, in his control. And so, you know, an attitude of thanksgiving, an attitude of reverence, an attitude of contentment, this is what praises God and ultimately gives him, uh, reflects his glory. And so, um, let me just wrap it up with this. A recap of what we learned today. That in two verses, we read that God's love is powerful that God's love is unfailing, that God's uh, faithfulness is everlasting, it's eternal, and that the ultimate evidence of God's love and His faithfulness is seen through our Savior, Jesus, His one and only Son, Jesus. And our response as we encounter Christ as we come to Jesus, as we're forgiven of our sin, as we're set free, made whole, filled with His Holy Spirit, uh, reconciled to the Father both now and forever. Our response, it's praise. Because praise is a direct reflection of His glory. We are just, you know, we're just mirrors of God's glory. We're walking around with this testimony of God's glory over our life. It's revealing His worth through us and praise is revealing His worth to the world around us. And so the question that I want to land on for, for all of us, this is what I've been asking myself this week, is am I living in praise? And what does that look like for me on a daily basis? Maybe, maybe for you, you know, maybe there's a little conviction. And you're like, you know what? Maybe I should start engaging in uh, worship and maybe living a little bit more out loud, my praise out loud, like turning on some worship music. Like maybe actually, you know, on Sunday mornings, engaging in your family room or wherever you're watching this, singing with your family together, like raising your hands in worship, what, you know, whatever that may look like, making a joyful noise to the Lord. I promise you he'll bless you there. I promise you that you'll find some freedom in the midst of a feeling, you know, uh, David says, I'll come, I'll, I'll become even more undignified than this. Like I'm just going to get, I'm going to get crazy with God. Like just dance and sing and, uh, and there will be joy. There will be blessing and freedom for you as you praise God in that way. Maybe, maybe for some of you, it's, you know, this week God is calling you to a place and you got to act out in that faith. Uh, you know, what is it? What is it that God is calling you to let go of so that you just trust in his love above everything else? In, in his faithfulness above, you know, what the world offers you, what the world promises Maybe for some of you, as it is for me today, we got to work on our attitude that we need, you know, in order to praise God on a daily basis, man, there has to be some sort of attitude adjustment for me. Like I'm working on just being more grateful in the ups and in the downs and the mountaintops and the valleys, just thanking God for what he's done in my life, for the answered prayer and for the unanswered prayer, thanking God for uh, his provision and his protection and, uh, and for sending him, uh, sending me his spirit to just provide me with joy and peace in the midst of, you know, uh, you know, dark moments. Thanking God, like just gratitude towards God. Maybe it's an attitude of reverence coming before him in, you know, your daily quiet time and, and, you know, moving beyond just checking it off the box for the day or, you know, coming to church and moving beyond just like, this is what I do on a Sunday morning, but reverently acknowledging his presence. Honor him in that moment. Maybe it's contentment, you know, uh, reorienting, reorienting our attitude towards like just being satisfied in him and who he is and what he's done in his provision and his you know fulfillment Jesus says I am the living water and I am the bread of life 
No one comes to the Father. No one encounters salvation except through me. Maybe it's just being content there. My, my hope, my prayer, church, is that we would take these steps that God has called us to, that we would live in praise, that we would reflect His glory, and that we would be a walking testimony of His glory for the world around us to see. Let's pray together. Jesus, we just, we love you so much. Thank you for the word today in Psalm 117, just the reminder of your love, your faithfulness, and the call to praise you. I pray, Lord, for those who don't know you, who are searching for forgiveness and fulfillment. I pray, Lord, that they would come to you, Jesus. The Bible says that that all who declare their mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that you would be saved. And so I pray, Lord, over those that don't know you, that they would encounter your forgiveness today repent, believe, and forever receive Christ as their Savior um, and forever receive the Holy Spirit as their guide. And so we pray, Holy Spirit, would you do a mighty work in our hearts right now to lead us closer to you, to inspire us with praise. Help us, Lord, to praise you out loud. Help us, Lord, to praise you by faith. Help us, Lord, to praise you with our attitude ultimately to reflect your glory and to be a testimony for the world. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray.